Income and wealth is not the opposite of poverty. The opposite of poverty truly is dignity. It's that ability to make choice. Charity has a role, but it too often creates dependency. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the podcast. My guest today is the very inspiring Jacqueline Novogratz, who is this incredible woman who has made an extraordinary impact on improving the lives of millions of people across the developing world. In addition to co-founding Rwanda's first microfinance institution, Jacqueline is also the founder and CEO of this organization called Acumen, which is a novel nonprofit that invests in people and companies and ideas solving the toughest issues of poverty. She's a pioneer of impact investing and Acumen and its investments have brought critical services like healthcare, education, and clean energy to literally hundreds of millions of low income people throughout the world. In addition to four TED Talks under her belt, Jacqueline is also the New York Times bestselling author of The Blue Sweater and her most recent book, Manifesto for a Moral Revolution which delves into the world's pressing need to reimagine and rebuild systems. So this is a conversation about many things. It's about the humility, the patience, the immersion, and the hard-edged hope that's necessary for tackling gigantic problems. It's also about this idea of moral imagination and the importance of transcending dualistic binary thinking and why that's required to not only eradicate poverty, but also to solve all of our planet's biggest problems and empower those most in need. As you'll soon discover, Jacqueline is just a badass. She's very wise, but also deeply soulful. I think we can all learn from her experience and her example. And I just love this one. So here we are. Please hit that subscribe button and enjoy. So nice to meet you. Thank you for coming out here. It is so wonderful to be here, truly. I'm uh, I'm a little nervous. I'm intimidated by you. <laughs> no, you are not. <laughs> I am. You're the ultra marathon guy that has millions of millions of people watching You're so you. <laughs> accomplished and the level of impact that you've had is is staggering in such a beautiful way. So I'm really touched and honored to be able to spend time with you today to learn more about how you do what you do, how you got there and really this beautiful struggle that you talk about around committing yourself to something bigger than yourself and what it means to live a purpose-driven life and pursue audacious goals with, you know, humility and embracing the long path and the obstacles that get thrown in your way and to fear not work that has no end, right? I love that. Which fear is not this work journey that, that no you're end. on. Yeah. Do you know Scott Harrison? Of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, he, he says that a lot. And I think about that a lot. Yeah. I love that, actually. Yeah. Because that's really, that's the journey that you're on, right? Like you're tackling such huge problems um, that have massive scale and you're chipping away at it. And you're able to maintain this enthusiasm and this positivity and this level of immersion and engagement that we're going to talk about without losing hope or becoming, you know, um, I'm sure there's discouragement, but without kind of like losing that energy that you infect all of these companies and these people with all across the world. Well, thank you. I, you do the same thing, um, just in a different way. I just feel like I sit here and talk into a microphone. Sometimes I feel neutered. Like I, I, I you know, when I read about you and the more that I learn about you, it's that boots on the ground, like you're showing up, you got the notebook, you're immersing yourself in these cultures and really committed to understanding not just the problems, but the people and what their needs are and the best way to solve the problem that of course includes capital, but above and beyond that really demands this nuance appreciation for the very particulars of their problems in the way that they lead their lives. Well, thank you, but do you really feel neutered? Because I feel that so much of leadership is finding who you really are. And I'm a doer, I, I have to build. Um, you, you amplify people, who they are. You're, I can already see what an incredible listener you are. And I've heard so many of your podcasts in this moment where nobody's listening to each other. Right. And no. 
And so we need those amplifiers. We need the doers. We need the intellectuals. We need the engineers. And so um, I always thought if I didn't do this, I could be a, a, a war journalist. Mm -hmm. um, but realized that I would be jumping into the war um, to try yeah. to fix it. Like that, <laughs> even though I have a visual sensibility, uh -huh. it's just not possible for me not to try and build something. Mm -hmm. And so do you really feel neutered? Well, sometimes I just feel like I talk a lot, but there's more that I could actually be doing, like on that point of being a doer. So or I don't know. Maybe you can. For you maybe you can help me out. Is. Maybe you can plug me in somewhere. Well, I totally could plug <laughs> yeah. you in. I know. Now, now, now I'm totally, scared. Now, you now I'm be really scared. scared. Don't ever offer me yeah. anything, yeah. Rich. <laughs> oh no. Um, so many things I want to cover with you, but before we even get into like the whole story, I know that you just returned from COP26, so I'm really curious about what that experience was like, and and you know what you were kind of left with, like how you're feeling about what went down, the work to be done, what might not have been addressed to the extent that maybe we wish that it was be was being uh, dealt with in a meaningful way. So yeah, like how was that? Sure. Well. Maybe the metaphor, and I'm saying this to one of the great athletes of the universe, but um, it was grueling to be there, you know, 18 hour days and and walking really far and and, uh, and also exhilarating and also frustrating. But the day after I threw my back for the first time in my life and I thought right there, there's the mm. metaphor that um, on the positive, I actually think that the media covered it from the outside almost only looking through a negative lens, a more cynical lens. And certainly there is room for cynicism and more importantly, skepticism. Um, on the other side, inside the room, governments were less vocal, but civil society and the private sector were really focused on getting things done. I felt a shift in responsibility that I've never felt mm. in in 20 years of running Acumen. Um, and that was very hopeful. Um, I went with uh, two objectives and two objectives only. One was to ensure that the voice of the poor were in every, was in every conversation. Um, because we talk about the need to mitigate carbon and clearly we have to reduce it by 59 gigatons every mm -hmm. year just to stay at 1.5 degrees. Um, but uh, when we think about climate justice, we often think about Europe and the United States, people who are losing their jobs, and we need to. But so must we look at the bigger picture, that you're looking at a continent like Africa, where 45% of the population has zero access to electricity, mm -hmm. where the median age is 19.7, where um, if you don't have electricity, you don't get to participate in this world where most kids now have smartphones they understand what the opportunities are, they're just locked out of them. Mm -hmm. And so um, when we think about how we build a world that is sustainable and inclusive and just, we have to mitigate carbon. And at the same time, we have to include people who've been fully left out in ways that avert long-term catastrophe. And so um, it was frustrating that the poor were not included in so many of the conversations and yet I felt a great sense of efficacy in that that opened so many new conversations. The second piece was to frankly find partners and raise money for the work that Acumen does. Um, because I believe that we are on our way to electrifying the whole world. Um, I don't wanna to get too technical here on you right up out of the box, but um, because of the work we've done for 15 years in trying to create a solar light and electricity for people who've been fully left out. Uh, we've been able to get electricity to about 160 million of the world's truly mm. poor people. Mm -hmm. That represents one third of all people on the planet who have access to solar light and, and electricity off grid who are poor. It's unbelievable. It's been very cool. It's given us a sight line then to what it would actually take to achieve sustainable development goal seven or universal electricity. Um, there are 800 million people still today, 150 years after Edison invented the light bulb with no access to electricity. Um, we think that the markets that have been built will bring 450 million people into electricity. 100 million people will have to 
give systems to. And then there are 230 million people. If you give them access, they will pay. They will want to buy their own systems. But giving them access requires doing business not as usual. Yeah. And that's what we want to do. And yeah. so um, really felt a great deal of hope that we were finding partners raising money for um, that effort to bring electricity to everybody on the planet. Well, it has to be easier now. I mean, Acumen's been around for 20 years yeah. at this point. And you know, you have legions of, of stories around how difficult it was to get the financial sector to wrap their head around this new business model that you were proposing. Um, but after two decades, there's proof in the pudding and you're seeing so much positive result from these many companies that you have seeded and fostered that um, the model has established itself. So it's gotta be easier, right? To get people on board and see the vision that you have. Easier, still not easy enough. You have a whole new generation that knows that capitalism isn't broken. And in fact, I would say you hardly meet anybody anymore that says unbridled capitalism is mm -hmm. good for the world. Um, but getting from that statement to actually structuring the right kind of capital at, at a level of scale that will, will shift systems still isn't easy, yeah. um, but it is easier because as you said, we can now show um, that what, what's required from all of us is to focus on the problems that we're solving first, rather than the kind of capital that we have. I have philanthropy, so I wanna give it away. I'm an investor, so I wanna maximize my mm -hmm. returns. Well, money is money. And so if we think about investment as a means to solving a problem, it changes everything. And if we focus on building systems that start with what will it take to bring the poor in? What will it take to make sure that the environment is protected? Well, then we can figure out the right kind of money and the right kind of investment to get there. Mm. There's so many things baked into what you just said that I want, there's so many threads I wanna pull on. I mean, the first of which is, the kind of underlying theme beneath all of it is transcending this compulsion that we have to think of problems in the world in binary terms, capitalism, socialism, for-profit business, philanthropy, and instead be, as you said, sort of problem oriented. Like here's the problem, what's the best way to solve it? Let's like get out of our, you know, sort of calcified thinking around how we've tried to solve these problems in the past unsuccessfully and see if we can't find a new way in that perhaps might be something we never thought of. Like that's the only way, right? And then the second thing being this systems approach, like you can't just show up, here's the problem, solve it, whether it's toilets or electricity or, or you know, affordable housing, like all of these problems that you've tackled, the solution seems to always lie in this immersion approach where your boots on the ground and you're really understanding what's happening and creating infrastructure around those entities that you're trying to create so that they can function properly. Like the toilet situation is a great example of that, right? Like you can, you can drop toilets in all of these places, but if there's no one to clean them or some kind of infrastructure to manage the, you know, the, um, the cleanliness of them, then they all fail, right? So it's, it's requiring you to think more broadly and realize that it's not just the problem itself, it's, it's this concentric circle of problems. Yeah, and you've said so much now that I wanna unpack. Um, starting with the word transcend, because I do think that that's such an important word um, for this moment in, in time, that we, we have seen the world in binaries, rich, poor, for-profit, non-profit, mm -hmm. even left, right, um, maybe one of the most toxic in this country anyway. Um, that 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 world may have worked when we were fully separate from each other. Um, but in a world that's fully interdependent, it doesn't work. We have to move to non-binary or non-dual thinking, which I appreciate in the way that you think and the way you speak. Um, and I love the story of the toilets as well, because it's a long, hard, grueling story that also bends your mind because we look at these stories in partial ways, right? We say, so often when it comes to the poor, we don't wanna give subsidies, but we're not acknowledging as the rich that much of our 
infrastructure is based on subsidies. So if you look at toilets at the macro level, one in three human beings on the planet still have no access to a toilet, mm. which is mind boggling in and of itself. The large majority of all subsidies for sanitation, for the toilets we flush, um, go to the top one sixth of wealth earners in the world. Um, and that's because governments are willing to pay for infrastructure. If you're looking at a slum like the slums outside of Nairobi where half the city lives, there's no room for infrastructure. You know, imagine all these little shacks kind of tumbling over mm -hmm. one another and these higgly piggly um, little alleys going through them where there's a lot of human waste and other kinds of waste because there's nowhere else for it to go. And as you said, well-intended charities and government programs would build latrines. As soon as those latrines get filled, um, they're done. Mm -hmm. The next progressive uh, step there was government would hire people called frogmen who would climb into the latrines and clean them out. Um, not a great job, yeah, but a, a paying job for people. And so there were many people who did that job. What this little company, and I say little at the beginning, um, Sanergy saw was one, the moral imperative and the also the adventure of solving a big hairy goal like sanitation. Um, they went into the Mukuro slum in Nairobi, three young entrepreneurs, um, and they started by immersing, as you said, this idea, get close to the problem, understand it from the people who live their perspectives. And they saw that not only do people understand their problem, but they wanted to be part of the solution. That area outside of Nairobi or in Nairobi is super entrepreneurial. And that there were mm. individuals who were already creating toilets that they were um, asking people to pay for, uh, to use, but they had no resources themselves to empty those toilets and keep them clean. So Sanergy built a system pretty much with the conceit that I shared at the time, this is a good 12, 13 years ago, that where government had failed, the private sector could fix the problem, social entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. and, um, and at the beginning, it looked like it might work. They would sell toilets to individuals who would charge to, for people to use them. They would keep them clean. There would be a mirror and a little vanity station. Every day they would pick up the waste um, and they would put it into a composting area with the idea that they would convert it and into fertilizer and somehow find a market for it. Mm -hmm. um, but then you have other constraints. Suddenly you have huge piles of fertilizer and it's really hard to build a market for fertilizer um, and you couldn't grow fast enough because there was such demand for it. That's when they started to recognize that they actually needed to partner with government. They needed different kinds of systems and standards. And so um, they've since completely evolved as a model. It's a hybrid, there, there's philanthropic components to it. They've got, now they're, they're serving over 100,000 people in the slums. I use those toilets whenever I'm there, I can vouch for them being clean and safe and a lovely experience. Um, but Sanergy, it's creativity on creativity on creativity. They, they, they realized it's really hard to sell fertilizer, but what that fertilizer offers is compost on which you can breed black soldier flies. Those black soldier flies then can be turned into um, animal feed, which is a much higher protein than fish food, which is, I mean, than fish, which is ground into food. Mm -hmm. It also has much lower suffering um, associated with it and much lower carbon because you're not moving from lakes, fish, fish right. to the lakes. And so it's become one of the world's great examples of a circular economy model for how we can solve our problems, starting with people who have the problems in the first place. Um, it's a model of partnership with government. Um, and it's a model of getting serious from a systems yeah. perspective of how we can solve some of the great problems of our days that are so complex and yet eminently solvable. Yeah, this that's a beautiful end-to-end -end solution that I imagine they couldn't have envisioned when they sought out at the beginning, right? It was only in the doing that all of that stuff gets revealed in the process of trying to make it work. Well, you write, write about this in your book that you don't start off and be like, I'm gonna run five mm. Ironbread and just run it. You start and you start to see what 
what the process reveals to you. And that shows you where to take right. another step and another step. And that's that's a big, you know, cornerstone of of your book, this idea of how, you know, when when people come to you and say, I want to save the world, or your own experience of being younger and and imbuing yourself with that sensibility, it can become paralyzing. And the solution really is in the doing, right? You have this thing, like just you just have to start. Like, what are you latching on to? Like, take that first step the way it's rigged, you're not allowed to see where it's headed, right? You only get to see the next step when you take that initial one and the path slowly, you know, the, the, the brick layer is like just one step ahead of you laying the bricks down in front of you. Our first COO, um, an amazing guy named Dan Tool, did not come from business as a background. He worked in emergencies um, for the United Nations. And he said, I feel like we're, we're standing in, on the fifth floor of a brick building and we're trying to build a terrace brick by brick with with no safety net underneath. Mm. It's like, sounds about right, Dan. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, the story of your life. It's the story. Right? It's the story. Of, yeah. It's the Sufi way. I mean, there, which goes back also to transcendence that there's this idea of how do you start a path? You take a step. Mm. Yeah. Well, let's uh, take it back and and kind of, parse your path from the beginning. I mean, you have a very interesting kind of origin story. I mean, you grew up with six siblings, seven of you guys. Your dad was an army guy, a veteran. And of all of your brothers and sisters, they all seem to have like matriculated into the world and they're all doing amazing things. So like what was going on in that house growing up? Because it's unbelievable between your brothers and sisters, like, everybody's doing something interesting, it seems. Um, well, we're all really lucky for sure. Um, the house was chaotic. Um, it was a, a small four bedroom house. I mean, we moved almost every year. In fact, at one point we were in Mount Clemens, Michigan. Um, so mm -hmm. uh, during the riots, but um, I think in part because we moved every year in the early years of my life until I was 10, um, and there were so many kids and so little space. We had no choice but to get along, um, find ways to create play together. My mother was and is one of the most extraordinary myth makers and tribe builders. And so I think she infected us with um, that sense of uh, both rules and possibilities. And so if we would get mad at each other, she would one, let us know that she might, you know, not like us in that moment, but she would always love us, that it was our job to show up for each other. If we didn't like each other, we had to love each other. Mm -hmm. um, and we definitely had to show up and we still do. You know, my mother is still, will give me the phone call. Like, what do you mean you're not gonna come to your sister's right. whatever? And I'm like, I just saw her two days ago. Um, and you guys all live in New York. We all live in New York. Except your, do your parents live in New York as well? <gasps> My parents live in DC. Um, my brother, Michael, who is um, in hedge funds and then Bitcoin and yeah, crypto. Yeah, big crypto guy. Big crypto guy, bought my mom and dad a house in Long Island. And um, so they're there about seven months of the year. Mm -hmm. And they're threatening to um, move from DC to New York because mm -hmm. they're in New York so much now. Um, but during the pandemic, I think that was the big move where we were all yeah. together. Um, and in the summer, my parents have a barbecue at their house at three o'clock every Sunday. And it doesn't matter how fancy your other engagement might be, you better be at my parents' <laughs> barbecue. Uh <-huh. laughs> That's kind of how the Novogratz yeah. family rules. <laughs> I mean, your mom just seems like a character, like well, you're a Novogratz and this is the way we do it. And here's what we're doing. Especially since she wasn't the Novogratz, right? Yeah. She, she, her dad died when she was a baby and she grew up the single mom in New York City. And um, yet she built the myths and um, had high expectations. And I think um, something you have said, my mom said, what? because I was like, you are creating all of these children and we have no balance at this family. And she was like, show me an ordinary, show, show me a person who's balanced yeah. who isn't ordinary. It's a myth. Like, that, oh, talk God. about a myth, you know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I love that. Well. This, um, you know, it's it's always, you can look at someone's life through the rear view mirror and it's like, of course you're doing what you're doing. Like it all makes sense. All of these experiences that you've had have added up to, um, 
you being the person that you are and the way that you kind of navigate the world. Um, but looking back, it appears that this, you know, wanderlust and this sensitivity around poverty and being a caretaker for those who have less has always been part and parcel of who you are. Yeah, I think, talk about lucky. I think there are some people who don't figure out who they are or what they they want to do at their most core part of who they are um, till very late in life. And I, I knew as a little girl that I was going to do something both to serve and also, as you said, um, to allow for a life of adventure. And that's really carried itself through. Um, and from the time I was six, but when I was probably 44 or 45, I got a, um, a random email from a boy I dated when I was 16. And he said, I was in the dentist and I saw this magazine article and I just want to tell you, Jacqueline, you're doing exactly today what you said you would do, be doing when you were 16 years yeah. old. And it really took my breath away because I don't remember being that clear as a 16 year old. I remember as a six year old mm -hmm. wanting to save the world. Um, I was a normal teenager, but I think I, I had that sense that I wanted to make change. Right. And certainly there's inflection points that end up pointing you in that direction, but I can't help but think short of those stories that I want you to tell that somehow you would have found your way to be doing exactly what you're doing anyway, right? Like by hook or crook. By hook or crook. Yeah, yeah. So you end up going to UVA, you study like international relations and economics, right? But the idea was you wanted to be a writer. I mean, was the the kind of, you know, war journalist thing part of that idea at that time? Um, funny, I've never thought about that. In a way, I think, at Virginia, um, you know, my, my middle-class army military dad, um, immigrant dad, um, was the one when he found out that I wanted to be an English major in his very quiet but powerful way said that he thought that was a very bad idea. Mm. Um, how would I ever support myself? And being a pleaser, so certainly for him, um, at that time, I... Uh, I took on economics, but I took every English course that I could get my hands on. And I think it was then, and I don't even know why, where I, I, I would read Sartre and Camus and even um, Joseph Conrad and find myself deeply drawn to this idea of good and evil and how are there good people and bad people or do good and evil lurk within the spirits of every person, which is what I deeply believe now. Um, and, and so maybe that was the connection then, um, from early on, uh, a pull toward conflict and, um, broken, mm. broken places, um, that started probably through my father being in Vietnam, but then through literature. Mm. So this desire to better understand the dynamics that would create that kind of conflict. Like, are these people truly evil? Who's good and who's the bad guy? Yeah, or is I, there such a thing? I think it was, is there such a thing? Yeah. Is there such a thing? Um, that early on trying to understand the Contras and the Sandinistas, which was part of my generation's moral conundrum. Mm -hmm. um, the deeper I would look into what was happening, the less sure I was of who was all good and who was all bad. And, um, and, and it was essentially recognizing that I didn't have such a black and white ability to come down with certainty that I thought I probably wouldn't be a very good journalist. Yeah. Um, and, but I wanted to know those places. I wanted to be in those places. I wanted to understand those places. And then layered on top of that was this um, sensitivity around poverty that 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 comes in part from stories your dad would tell about being overseas, being deployed, and the poverty that he bore witness to. For sure, he's a quiet guy, but I would ask him questions all the time, 
And um, I was curious about the children mostly. And my dad worked with an orphanage um, on one of his tours in Vietnam. Uh, And it didn't make sense to me that they were so poor and we were not. Uh, I would say it's, it was also very much the, the Catholic school upbringing and the, the sort of so, the, this social justice element mm-hmm. of my family. But honestly, Rich, it was also, sometimes I think you're born with parts, the, some of the seeds that become who you are, that as a little kid, I was always drawn to the runt of the puppy litter. Yeah. You know, my mother tells the story of, you know, finally having enough money that they could buy this perfect English sheepdog. Um, I was probably nine. And we went to the farm to get the perfect English sheepdog that she'd been studying. And then I saw the runt of the litter and it was clearly had a problem, was probably blind and <laughs> mentally disabled. And uh-huh. I was like, how, how could you be such a horrible person that you're going to make us get this perfect dog that everybody will want to, need to take care of the little one? Yeah. My mother was like, oh. You're just wired that way. I think. Yeah. I think. I mean, I would ask you, do you think you're like, who you are is probably how you came out? A lot of it, you know, I believe in change as well, um, but I think constitutionally, yeah, we come out the way we are. And, you know, as a parent of four kids, I can tell you like- Each one. Yeah, like they're, they come out pretty quickly. You can tell this is who this person is and they stay that way fundamentally throughout their lives. So yeah, I think we come in with a certain wiring and inclinations and dispositions. Um, and yet, despite this, you end up, you know, in this interview for Goldman Sachs or not Goldman Sachs, Chase Manhattan, which is just like, you know, confusing. <laughs> it was confusing. Yeah. Well, but I remember just to say, like, I'm I'm a couple of years younger than you, but I remember in college, the career centers and the career paths were not what they are today. Like you would go there and they'd be like, well, it's Boston Consulting and it's Bain and it's this well, investment bank and that investment bank. And like, that was kind of it. And that was even more advanced than when I went. Um, you know, in, 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 in our generation, in my generation, there weren't a lot of options. I didn't know what the nonprofit sector was. Yeah, I knew there were these charities, but I didn't think there was an inter- interesting career there. And um, I and thought that if you work for them, you didn't get paid. Like you just, the only way to do it would be to volunteer. And you were sort of saintly. Yeah, me too. And um, and I had paid for college, so I was I really did, wasn't that interested in going straight into work after I had been working nonstop for my whole life. I wanted to go, you know, ski in Colorado for a year and experience what all my friends had had in their lives that I'd never really been able to do. Fun mm-hmm. in that way. I always had fun, but um, and and so our career office just had these little boxes where you could put your resume into the different boxes that took your 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 majors. And so I put my name in the boxes and Chase Manhattan called. And I really said to my, my roommates, I was living with these two women, I was like, this is ridiculous. I don't wanna do this interview. And they like, just do it. And I promised my mom and dad that I would do the interviews. And I had one suit that I owned. And so I walk into this interview with my foreign affairs and economics degree. And this really cute guy is sitting at a table in this little room and he says, so Miss Novogratz, why do you wanna be a banker? And it was truly the one question I was fully unprepared to answer. Um, not being a liar, I just didn't hesitate. And I said, I, I don't wanna be a banker. My mom and dad are making me do this interview. <laughs> and, and you could just see his face. <laughs> it was uh-huh. just like, huh, well, that's really unfortunate. Because if you got this job, you would be in 40 countries in the next three years learning all about the political and economic um, structures and situations in in those countries, which of course was a big part of really what I wanted to do with my Mm -hmm. life was to go. I had never been outside the United States, barely on a plane at that point. And um, and so then it was just like, man. So I said, do you think we could um, start this interview over? And he smiled and said, sure. So got up, walked out of the room, knocked on the door, extended my hand, said, you know, hi, I'm Jacqueline Novogratz. And he said, so tell me, Ms. Novogratz, why do you want to be a banker? And I said, ever since I was five years old, all I ever wanted to be was a banker. And, um, and 
He laughed. <laughs> I laughed. And he's like, yeah. so you know, sh- let's see how good you are. Then he would throw uh-huh. out these questions and he'd be like, so your your foreign affairs and your your real focus is Eastern Europe and um, and Southeast Asia. So tell me about the Middle East. And I'd say, I don't know anything about the Middle East. He's like, I know. <laughs> tell me about it anyway. Uh-huh. I was like, okay. You're like, this is going very well. <laughs> I just assume there is no way on earth that this guy is going to move me to the next level. And I was a bartender. I went to the bar. Work till three in the morning. My little suit was crumpled into a ball in the back of my backpack that I rode on my bike home. Get home and pre-cell phones. On the little table by the door is a piece of paper that says, Chase called you back, you had a 7 a.m. interview. And I'm thinking, okay, how are we gonna pull this one off? <laughs> You're gonna have to iron that suit. <laughs> got the iron, it's got so, the blow dryer. <laughs> I mean, Jacqueline, it's so crazy. And I know you've been asked this before, but there's a couple interesting things about this. I mean, not the least of which is the audacity or the gumption to tell the guy you don't want the job right out of the gate. That's very unusual. Most people you know, would be a shrinking flower in the wake of such a question and try to scramble to answer it in, a, you know, in, a, in an appeasing way, I suppose. And then the second piece of asking for a do-over. So there's this kind of truth-telling compulsion that you have and also this fearlessness to kind of ask the question that most of us would be too afraid to ask. Um, and, I, and, and on the point of you being asked this question before, I still don't know that I've gotten a satisfactory answer. Yeah, yeah. On where no. that comes from. I think the, um, I, I do think inside of, me and maybe everybody is this, both the cocky and the unsure, the audacious and the humble, Mm -hmm. the worthy and the not sure how worthy you actually are. And so, um, and I do know that I'm, I am a truth teller, um, so much so that I'm really, I can't read speeches. You know, I have to connect and just, speak and it drives my communications team insane. Um, And that's related to it somehow, Mm -hmm. that if I know what I'm talking about, I can talk, I can talk about it, but I can't make, I can't make something up unless everyone knows I'm making it up and then I can have fun. So I think the first part was, it was the truth. And I, I wasn't looking for a job. And I was only doing it because my mom and dad made me do it. Um, Not made me do it, but you know. And if you didn't want it, there wasn't much to lose. The the stakes weren't high. Mm -hmm. Uh, It it felt so ridiculous to me that I was in there in this little gray suit that I got it hit or miss. um, Trying to maybe get this job or maybe not. I didn't even know. And, um, And so, and then the idea for me at that point of traveling to 40 countries was like, like not a possibility at some level. Um, and again, I'm, you know, I'm sure in my mind there was like, I will travel the world like, mm-hmm. like Gertrude Bell on a camel, right? You know, go off and be the, the, the lone wanderer, not someone saying on a plate, I'm gonna hand this to you, want it? And there was no way I was gonna say no. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly what you were hoping to manifest in your life. And you would then be getting paid to travel to all of these places and immerse yourself in the economies of all of these foreign countries and garner this unbelievable education about how the world works. And in truth, I had no idea what banking even was anyway. All I saw was 40 countries where I cared about politics. I cared about the economies. I cared about people. I didn't really know what it meant to be a banker. Um, and in fact, it was funny when I first came back to the bar I worked at in the summertime and everybody was so proud of me for um, being a bank teller, which was the sort of what everyone thought a banker was. Right. And, um, and truth was I made more money at the bar than I did at the <laughs> bank anyway. So it was, it was a funny moment. Mm. Um, the idea of investment banking and consulting, that was... I was still a few years away, I think. 
Mm -hmm. So you get the job, you move to New York and suddenly you're on a plane and you're flying around and like, what are you actually doing when you're going to these places? Um, so it was called credit audit and we would be essentially handed this big stack of loans that Hong Kong or Kuala Lumpur or Buenos Aires offices had made. And we would go on these big yellow sheets of paper. Um, we would look at the financials. Um, we'd look at the purpose of the loan. We'd look at how it was structured. Was it was it variable interest or long-term interest? And we would um, assess the creditworthiness of the bank's loan portfolio. Mm -hmm. The early 80s was a really powerful time to do that because it what you had um, wild inflation and wild uh, financial crisis. So you actually had hyperinflation. In one day, Brazil's currency could, could change by 800%, always in the wrong way for Brazil. So suddenly company after company and nation after nation was defaulting on their debt. Um, at the same time, the Saudi gold, I mean, oil was becoming like gold. And so the banks were really liquid or had been really mm -hmm. liquid. And so they were making stupider and stupider loans because they had this money to push out the door. And so from a macro perspective, I found it just fascinating for, because for the first time in my life, I saw the world as all connected. That was happening in oil had a direct influence on who was getting money in another completely different part of the world. Right. I also saw how the rich were treated so differently from the poor and that $100 million loans would be made to elites in, I keep picking on Brazil, but that's, that was the country that had such an impact on me. And um, it was clear if you, once I learned to see story and narrative in financials, um, it was clear that the person who borrowed had no intention to ever repay. Sometimes they would move the money right offshore to protect it so that they had the money. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they would use part of it, um, but uh, there was a lot of fraud and the bankers often didn't follow up. Everything was based on a, shake, a handshake and relation, relationship based on being in the same club. Right. And so, I found that both fascinating and terrifying. And at the same time, because we all read about the developing world as these really poor places, and yet there I was in this incredibly alive, beautiful, colorful, joyous place, I would be drawn into communities um, that were poor. I didn't think of them as poor. I just saw them as most colorful, vibrant, mm -hmm. joyful communities. Mm -hmm. and, and then I realized those people were fully excluded. They would never have a chance to get even a $10 loan. And maybe they would be better at repaying it because they would have such a sense of um, obligation in ways that, that the too many, not obviously not everyone, but too many of the elites weren't mm -hmm. taking seriously. So walk me through the process of how you take those experiences, the more that you kind of understand these, the tectonic plates of macroeconomics and how it's sort of marginalizing and depriving these poor people of access to capital and getting to understand kind of what that dynamic looks like, how you step into this idea of, of possibly tackling it as, um, you know, as a vocation. You're a banker. I mean, you could have stayed there and had this successful career. You were moving up the ladder, but at some point you you jump off the chain. You were talking about stakes in that first interview. Um, high stakes, low stakes. I think it plays a big role in a human being's lives in those, those decision points. Um, are you in a high stakes moment? Are you in a low stakes moment? And sometimes when it's a high stakes moment, there's greater clarity to what the decision actually means. So I would say two, if not three things were happening simultaneously. One, I'd had this epiphany that 
the poor had no access and 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 yet we were writing off hundreds of millions of dollars of loans um the I didn't think I needed to leave the bank because I, I actually loved so much about it. And some of my very best friends I, I met in that period. Um, and I thought that, that my boss might be interested in the idea of me building a unit inside of the bank where we actually lent to low income people because I was sure we were gonna get better repayment rates than um, the bank was getting. Um, at a macro level. Um, the second thing that happened, I guess there were three things. At the time, I, I stumbled ac across this article about a little known man at the time named Muhammad Yunus, who ended up being the founder of the Grameen Bank and got the Nobel Peace mm -hmm. Prize for the work he did on just this idea. Make was he, the, he was the pioneer of microfinance. He was one of the the, the pioneer, but he, he was the greatest storyteller and um, I would say there were three or four, but it was 1976, talk about patience, right. when he first made 30 small loans to 30 desperately poor Bangladeshi women and saw that they all paid back in a nation where the average repayment rates at the banks were something like 15%, right. 85% right, write-offs, right, right, right. right? So I read that, I was seeing it with my own eyes and went to the bank. And then the third thing that happened was this incredible man, Tony Trisiano, who was the number two person at Chase, had offered me the chance to essentially sit at his right side mm -hmm. and, and build a, a fast track career. Um, and he was an extraordinary man. Um, I think he saw in me the scrappy person that he was and is. Um, and so he kept raising the stakes. You know, I wasn't finding anything that was perfect. I couldn't find anything in Brazil. I knew I, I had stumbled upon this and I wanted to do it. Uh, somehow test whether you could lend to low-income people. Um, and, uh, and so I was stumbling or fumbling toward finding an opportunity, Mr. Triciano, kept offering, well, you don't, you want to work in Spain? Where do you want to work? Mm -hmm. Pick a place. Um, the Texas banks were hurting, Why not go, go fix that, go help me fix that problem. And, um, and I think that was the clarifying moment for me that here's a fast track, here's no track. Um, I don't know if you'll ever get on that fast track. And my father definitely thought that I had thrown away, mm -hmm. you know, that once in a lifetime opportunity. And I might have, but I knew that if I went with him, I would have stayed on that track. That's a really hard track to get off of. And there was no opportunity for you to say to him, let's start a, a, a microfinance branch in Brazil and see how it goes and let me run it and prove to you that we can make it work. Or was that something that was just too far afield and not That's interesting to- such a great to question. I, I might have lacked the courage or, or the imagination because I asked my boss, um, who I didn't respect as much, but maybe because this was like, it was kind of, remember that show, Get Smart with the doors that opened yeah, and shut? This is the big dude. To get to the 60th yeah, you're in floor, the executive you took wash this room thing guy. all the way to the yeah. top and the doors would <laughs> open and he would be sitting yeah. behind this, this desk and uh -huh. I was there with my, you know. Mix. And you're 25, right? And or I'm 25 like years old. Yeah. and. Um, yeah, I think I may have lacked the, the courage mm. to, to do a deal with him. It was either the, the, the deals on the table or go off into right. this unknown territory. So you split. So I split. Yeah. How are mom and dad with that? Not great. Um, and again, you know, context and time, I was going to a place they'd never been able to imagine, very few of us could. Uh, no cell phones, no real way of connecting. I didn't have health insurance. Um, I couldn't explain to anybody exactly what I was doing. And, um, and man, was it easy for them to tell people that their daughter, and there weren't that many young women who worked on Wall Street at mm -hmm. the time, 
had this fancy job where she was traveling all around the world telling bankers how to do their business better. That's a good story. Um, telling them that they were living in, I was living in places that they couldn't find on a map doing something that they didn't understand or weren't able to articulate. Um, didn't feel quite the same. Right. And then there was the fear factor. I think particularly for my mother, my father had been in Vietnam. Um, for my mother, I was never gonna get married. That was a big piece for her. Um, and um, something bad was surely going to happen to me. Mm -hmm. And would I ever come back? I think we underappreciate the extent to which those social pressures keep us in situations we don't wanna be in. It takes a lot of courage when you're the oldest, right? Mm. Of all your siblings. I'm sure your parents were very invested in your path and all of that. And it's, it's hard. Well, and also maybe invested in me continuing to be a role model and a helper in the, the six that were coming up. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and you're a parent, you wanna keep your children safe. Sure. Of course. So how do you figure out what the next move is? Um, there was a woman at, well, I, I wrote to the big, the big names, um, Muhammad Yunus, Abed, uh, Ilabat in, in India. Um, those were the days where it took 10 days to get a letter mm -hmm. across the world. Nobody wrote me back. But a woman I worked with had an aunt named Michaela Walsh who worked with Women's World Banking and um, she was in New York City. And so I went to her and I, um, I said, I wanted to go to Brazil and I would help build Women's World Banking in Brazil. And she said, that was great, but they had no opportunities there. And there was, however, a job in West Africa in the Cote d'Ivoire, not exactly on my game plan, but um, I said, yes. Didn't ask for any details, missed the health insurance piece. Mm -hmm. And um, and literally probably a month later, sold everything. My mother still reminds me, you know, she had given me some good antiques that were just left on the corner for someone to pick up. And, uh, <laughs> Cote d'Ivoire. There I was, Cote d'Ivoire. So I feel like this is another you know, this experience is another inflection point in your education of, of appreciating the complexity and nuance of the problems that you were, you know, audacious enough to even tackle. On so many levels, Rich. Um, audaciousness, but also arrogance. Uh, it never dawned on me to ask whether I would be properly introduced. Um, I was really happy um, with the way my job was described that I would be an ambassador to African women and I would help them set up these little microfinance entities across the continent, starting in the Ivory Coast, the Cote d'Ivoire. Um, I had a, an office at the African Development Bank and, um, and, and it all just sounded amazing to me, the, this amazing entrepreneurial opportunity. Of course, I get there and I'm fully and wholly rejected by the, the West African women, um, wondering why a 25 year old who spoke terrible French and had no understanding of their culture um, should be the ambassador to African women. Right. Um, good point. The white savior white here savior. to save the world. Um, we don't Eye rolls ensue. And no one wants saving, thank you very much. And certainly not by people who haven't even spent any time truly even understanding who you are, um, why you are. And, um, and second, this was a very prestigious office. And so there was also the other side that why should I get it, not them, Did, right? And, right. And, and and so I so ensued um, probably six months of failure after failure, um, really really difficult situations that were many of them from my own blind spots, and 
some from very ambitious women who saw me in the way of their ambition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was a very toxic combination. Mm -hmm. So how long were you there? Um, I was only there for about um, six months, but um, it was definitely a defining moment, one that almost broke me. You know, they say, what, kill, what doesn't kill you, make you makes mm-hmm. you stronger. Sometimes it just doesn't kill you. And uh, I definitely remember walking down the street one day where these gr- dogs were growling at me and just being like, go ahead. You know, everyone else hates me too. <laughs> oh, um, no. I was very but, low. But it does make you stronger though, because it's a, it's a formative experience in which you realize like you've been disabused of, of everything that you kind of thought about how to approach these things. So you, you depart with your tail between your legs, but you've had a valuable experience. I mean, you're very frank about these failures that you've had along your path, but each one of them kind of informs the next step. And, you know, all is, is part of this, um, you know, journey towards really understanding how to be the best, you know, steward and servant to these solutions. Sure, it, it does make you stronger, there's no doubt. Um, the, it, it definitely in a crazy way reinforced my commitment. I was not leaving. Um, and my, my parents lived in Germany. My dad was still in the army then. And I went to, um, Heidelberg for Christmas time. I was jaundiced. Um, I... I couldn't have been skinnier. I was just this like tiny, tiny thing. Um, I was probably running 16 miles a day just to probably run away. I don't know. Yeah. And um, and then my mother and I had the big blowout. Um, I'd been. Ooh, tell me about this. I I I, you know, I whether I had been. Um, deliberately poisoned, or I had mistakenly gotten the worst food, food poisoning um, a person could get. I lie on a in a bathroom floor for eight days, um, really fully dehydrated and um, and really in trouble. I mean, just to be clear, you you when you left, it was under threat. You know, there was there was there was threat. Yeah, there, there was, was threats, and you had been forewarned that you could possibly be poisoned. Yeah. And you ultimately do get sick and it's unclear whether you were actually poisoned or suffered some kind of food poisoning It was definitely or crescendoing by the Yeah, minute. but that's terrifying. It was terrifying. I mean, I left the country, I, I, when I finally got well enough, you know, I bought a ticket that day. I did go to the women in a way that does not sound like a broken person. And I really, I mean, I remember looking at them. They were so beautiful. Uh, and I was so conscious of being such a little bedraggled, skinny white thing. And they were like the, the, these gorgeous women in these turbids and jewelry and flowing robes of yellow and purple. I mean, yellow and orange and pale blue. Um, I can, I, I'm like there in the room with them. And um, somehow I had the courage then to say, I know I made a lot of mistakes, but I wouldn't treat any creature the way you treated me. And I'm totally alone. And um, and we need to do better if we're going to heal this world. That somehow those words came out. And um, I wasn't, I wasn't um, hectoring. I was just, it makes me cry. You know, I was just saying truth. And, um, and they couldn't really take it in. Mm. You know, it was just that then pregnant, quiet. And uh, and then I left. I left my two boxes of my prize poetry and whatever random few possessions that I owned uh, in the hotel, never to go back and get it. And um, And so you can imagine my mother seeing this transformed young woman um, show up and announce, well, now I'm going back to East Africa. I still Mm -hmm. don't really have a job, but don't worry, mom, 
it's going to be fine. You um, quickly recharged your battery and said, I'm going to go to Ken was Kenya, Kenya was next, right? Kenya. Yeah. Um, yeah, I don't even, I don't, I don't even think I experienced my battery as not charged at some level. It was just, I'm going to go, I'm going to be home. I am definitely going to eat a lot. Um, my boyfriend met me um, in Germany and um, everyone just was just like, you can't go back. And I felt like there was a form almost of um, that their fear couldn't hold me back and that if I didn't go, it was going to it was going to affirm too many people's expectations of what this place was, this continent was, that I knew that even though these particular individuals and I had had a hard experience, I already had seen how extraordinary people were and what was possible. I knew I was in love with it. And so again, going from duality to the complexity of mm -hmm. what it means to be human. I wasn't blind to that. In fact, I was so drawn to, to life there and to the people there and to the culture there. But just as I could not go in any longer as a savior, no could I, nor could I any longer see Africa um, in inverted quotes, as a perfect place where a community flourished and everyone was kind to each other. I went back um, after those two weeks as a, um, a much more nuanced person going to um, invest, if you will, mm -hmm. with a clear understanding that this was about... Uh, the human journey that I was a part of, I was neither in control of it, nor would I be controlled by it, but that I wanted to engage in relationship. Mm -hmm. And so to your point, what, ki what doesn't kill you make you stronger. It, it was a, it was a, a rapid rinse and forget the dry cycle, just throw you right back. Right. Um, but as a completely different person. Right, with kind of this hope, but a more harder edged hope and an appreciation for, for the ferocity that is gonna be demanded of you in order to just survive and, and make your way, let alone, you know, produce change yeah, or catalyze the, change. And the beginning maybe of a, of a superpower that I think that you have too is um, being able to sit in a room and just really pay attention to the room and to the people in the room, not in a naive, idealistic, nor cynical way, but start to figure out who's who in the room, what dynamics are happening in the room. I think that the experience in Cote d'Ivoire really jump-started it and then accelerated that, that skill set. Mm -hmm. um, so that I could, I could get really tangible things done um, without losing that sense of idealism and hope. Mm -hmm. And how long were you in Kenya? Well, it's complicated because um, I was only in Kenya a few months where I had another flaming fail. Um, that uh, when these Rwandan women walked into my office there and said, we are from Rwanda. I thought they said Uganda. Um, that's how I was at the time. Um, and uh, they just passed a new law changing the Napoleonic Code, 1986, so that women no longer had to get their husband's permission um, when they opened a bank account. And, um, and they wanted to see whether it might be possible to have some kind of financial institution for women. And it was the first time that African women had ever asked me to do anything. And so I said, I said, yes. Yeah, you're being invited, which invited is a big in. difference, right? Come in. It was Felicula, is that her name? Um, or was she later? This was a that, woman named Landrada who I changed her name in the blue sweater, but, um, and Revocata who I changed, I've changed both of their names because I was worried when I wrote that book. 
But, um, and I went sort of similar. I went with a, one suitcase and, and, and then for the next two years, I pretty much went back and forth between Rwanda and Kenya. I would have stayed in Rwanda, but, um, early on a woman named Immaculate, um, uh, who was one of our co-founders and one of the first three parliamentarians, um, I got malaria and she gave me a big gift and said, we love working with you. This is great. We're building this bank, but it is, um, you are maniacal. You know, you're just going so fast and our lives don't work that way. And so, um, if we're truly going to build this as a Rwandan institution, which I was committed to do, we've got to do it in a way that doesn't fully depend on you. And I was both crushed and exhilarated because I did want this to be a Rwandan institution. I didn't want to stay there for the rest of my life. And so we came up with this plan that I would um, work there for two months and then I would go to Kenya and work there for two mm -hmm. months. And there was another woman who was a dear and is a dear mentor from the Philippines, Mary Rosales. She ran UNICEF regionally and she saw that we were building a bank for women. And Mary, um, who was the one I would really go to, to cry um, with when things got really hard, she said, we have a lot of work to do with women and enterprise and income generation. And so don't worry about it. We have a job for you when you're in Kenya. And so I would flip back and forth between the two countries um, for the next two years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this bank ends up taking root and becoming successful. And what's interesting is that, I mean, first, you know, I wanna spend some time focusing on the 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 fact that so much of the work that you do and 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 truly the solutions that you're committed to are oriented around women and in the in particular with microfinance it's all about the women right the women being the kind of financial bookkeepers and the decision makers about how funds are allocated and the empowerment of these women to create some level of financial independence um, and how that uh, really creates a foundation for a more functional society. So talk a little bit about like the women being like the key component in all of this. Hmm. So I never say this, um, but when I first went to work with women in, in banking and women in Africa, it felt a little funny to be honest, because I was raised again, a different generation with four alpha male brothers um, in a big patriarchal extended family. And so I spent a lot of my youth proving that I was as tough as the boys were. And so this idea that now I'm going to do women's things was not comfortable at the beginning. Mm. And then I moved to Africa and saw that 80% of the food was grown by the women. That, um, that especially in West Africa, you actually divided who earned income and what was paid for by whom because you had these polygamous families. And s my whole world shifted um, when I saw firsthand how women were excluded, how women, yet women were the backbone. They were the backbone of family. They were the backbone of who paid for school, who made sure the kids got educated. They were the background, back, backbone for culture. And they did so much of the, of the work and yet were seen as chattel, mm -hmm. um, as possessions, had no rights, were not schooled. Um, and, and that fundamentally changed me. And in some ways it is often the ones that are the doubting but curious that I think become maybe the best ambassadors 
because I never used the language when I would see women because I couldn't stand the language of women in development. Women are more honest, women are more this. And I would think, people are people. However, what I did see was how women were systematically, fundamentally excluded from opportunities that would actually enable the economy to, to flourish mm-hmm. and that we will never build a world when we systematically oppress and yeah. in some cases erase 50% of the population. So, so that changed again, a new layer of nuance that if there would be one man in the room at the time, women wouldn't tell the truth. Um, mm. And so I had to make rules. If we were talking about Dute Dembere, which was the name of our bank, the men weren't allowed. Um, women needed to have that place where they had the confidence and the freedom to tell the truth. Sorry to interrupt the flow. We'll be right back with more awesome. But first, I do want to snag a quick moment to talk about something I care a lot about, which is the importance of nutrition. And the thing is, most people I know actually aspire to eat better, to incorporate more whole plants, fruits, vegetables, seeds, beans, and legumes into their daily regimen. Sadly, however, without the proper tools and support, very few end up sticking with it. And so, because adopting a plant-based diet transformed my life so profoundly, and because I want everyone to experience some version of what I've experienced, we decided to tackle and solve this very common problem. And the solution we've devised, I'm proud to say, is the Plant Power Meal Planner, our affordable all-in-one digital platform that sets you up for nutrition excellence by providing access to thousands of customizable, super delicious, easy to prepare plant-based recipes. Everything integrates with automatic grocery delivery. You get access to our team of amazing nutrition coaches seven days a week and many, many other amazing features. To kickstart your health intentions this new year, we're offering you $20 off a one-year membership with the code POWER20 throughout the entire month of January. Again, that's promo code POWER20 for $20 off at meals.richroll.com. All right, back to the pod. There was this idea, you know, in the early days of microfinance that uh, it would just be throwing money away that these people would not repay their loans. And in fact, it's quite the opposite. Like the the repayment um, percentage is way higher than it is for loans doled out to, you know, higher people socioeconomic like echelons. <laughs> yeah. Um, but that was also a lesson that you learned, right? Because initially there were some issues around that until you built in the accountability piece that has the added bonus effect of, of, of also kind of sowing the seeds of, of dignity, which is like a huge part of this whole mission. Yeah. Rwanda was a big aid recipient. And so the way people interacted with particularly anything foreign was to accept grants. You'd walk down the street and kids would say, don't we, don't want do fran- give me 10 francs. And I would say, no, 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 no. I'd be like, don't want 10 francs. You know, you give it to me. And they would look at me like, but you're rich, madam. And I'd say, let's talk. Let's have a conversation. It, it so offended me that we had this, so many people who were interacting in a way that was tantamount to begging and not enabling themselves to be who they could be. So when we first started, particularly this bakery that I started, um, the women ripped us off blindly. Mm-hmm. Uh, it didn't because take it was much. government run, right? It was like this charitable organization, so it was, nobody was, it was invested. It was run by the Good Sisters. Mm. Um, it was a charitable organization, not government, but they they probably wisely took what they could take. When it was clear, and they finally believed me that this wasn't mine, this was theirs, and so we had a choice. We we build it in a way that is financially sustainable that allows them to grow and prosper. Mm -hmm. Or it becomes like too many of the other stupid projects that we had seen where it works for a few years and then it's gone. How does that happen? There are so many well-intentioned people in philanthropy and yet, you know, there's just too many stories of, you know, funds just ending up, you know, there's all kinds of, 
uh, issues around corruption and just organizations being poorly run and the money seems to disappear and nobody ends up benefiting and it's all like a, just a big clusterfuck. Yeah. Like how does it, how does that happen with people who I'm sure are trying to do the right thing and help? I often say that distance dulls the moral imagination. And so we, we want to do good. We want to be part of good. And so we give money, um, hoping it does good, but that's not enough. We've actually got to build in systems that have like, to your, to your word of accountability, generosity without accountability, um, can really make a mess of things. And, and, and it's not the same as justice. Justice is hard. Generosity can be hard, but it's a lot easier than justice. And so um, when there's no accountability in systems, and if you think about an aid system where people are coming and going, they're not vested, it becomes even easier for many of the different players to take different pieces of whatever is available. Mm -hmm. So it's gotten a lot better, but I did this um, study of 200 of these women's groups in in Kenya in one of the two months that I was there. And what I saw was a, a, a pretty terrifying cycle where the philanthropist or the aid organization would give money to a women's group. They immediately would give a 10% kickback to the local district officer mm -hmm. because the money had to go through him. Then they had no skills to cooperatively, cooperatively run their chicken farm or whatever they were given the money for, usually decided by some um, government official or foreigner. Um, the whole thing would fail. But whenever the dignitaries would come to see how the project was doing, the women would parade out some put little chicks. On. They'd put a show on. They would go buy Fantas. Um, sometimes they would, and biscuits, sometimes they would kill a goat. and. After looking at these 200 groups, I could only conclude that the majority of them were spending money to keep this whole farce alive. Mm. And um, I remember staying up all night one night writing the report. And the, the first line was, good intentions lead the path to hell. Another famous say, saying of yeah. my mother. Um, and I just felt such rage that there was a machine that ultimately was a big lie that if we really cared about enabling people to solve problems, this is not the machine we would be building. Yeah. And on top of that, the, you know, as generous as the spirit is that's that's donating all of these things, it doesn't respect the dignity piece because nobody wants to be just a charity case, right? Like this is another kind of facet of, of the things that you talk about in the book which is finding a way to inspire that, that dignity. And that comes with this model and this approach where um, these people aren't on the receiving end of charity, they become stakeholders and invested. So you're aligning the incentives, right? A lot of these problems you're talking about, there's a misalignment of incentives that butts up against a lack of accountability that creates like all of these problems. And acumen is really a reimagination of the model that is this hybrid between philanthropy and you know proper investment banking or venture capital to get those incentives um, in parallel with the best interest of solving the problem and getting people really engaged themselves, the people who are on the receiving end of it. Is that? I, I you want to like run my I just marketing like, I don't know. I, just, I don't awesome. feel like I articulated that no, very you, well I, at it all. It was beautiful. <laughs> it, the, you, you articulated it beautifully because, yeah, what I learned more than anything else, and certainly after the Rwandan genocide, but in story after story like this, is that many well intended people see a chance to give a grant and get people a little bit more income for their income generating process project but that income and wealth is not the opposite of poverty, that the opposite of poverty truly is dignity. It's that ability to make choice. And so when I started Acumen, the whole focus was on what systems would you build to enable human dignity? 
rather than just make sure people get some income. And, um, and it felt very clear to me then, particularly after all of these experiences, that uh, markets have a real role to play because there's a distribution and a scaling that, mm -hmm. that's natural. You, you have self-organizing mechanisms through the good part of capitalism and it's limited. It too often leaves out the poor and in the worst of cases, it exploits the poor. Charity has a role, but it too often creates de de dependency. So what if we took philanthropy and invested it in those entrepreneurs that were hell-bent on solving some of the biggest problems of our day, like sanitation, like education, like energy, like agriculture. What if we gave them time to really understand the true constraints and the obstacles that get in poor people's way and build solutions so that at the end of the day, they could send their children to schools they wanted to send their children to. They could get access to good healthcare they could um, get electricity. Although I wasn't thinking about electricity 20 years ago. And um, because what I'd seen over and over was that the poor actually pay more in these broken markets than the middle class pay anyway. It's not like the poor are sitting around waiting for somebody to get them water. It just happens to be dirty. And the water they get access to is often supplied by what's called mafias. Mm. Um, extortionary providers. Uh, and so it seemed to me that we could start with recognizing that every human being wants to solve their own problems. We want to be part of contributing in one way or another and build those systems that at the end of the day, not only allow that kind of flourishing, but... Um, solve all of our problems. Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I think you're, you should run your own marketing department at your company because that was beautifully put. Thank um, you. But, and secondly, you know, this begs the question of, of um, two things. First, this idea of patient capital, because these, you know, if you're gonna change systems and you know, address infrastructure and and create these proper incentives and all of this, like this is a lot of work and this is gonna take a lot of time, complex, right? Um, and then second to that, um, but very important of course, is redefining how you think about success, not in terms of profit and loss or investor return, but more broadly in terms of, um, I feel like the word impact gets thrown around a lot, but like you tell me like what, what the metrics are that you came up with in order to gauge whether, you know, an infusion of capital or, um, you know, lifting up entrepreneurs who are gonna go into these areas and, and solve a particular problem, like how you're gauging their progress and, you know, whether they're successful or not. There are a lot of questions. I know, I was that. sorry. No, that was more good, like it's a good, rant. It's good, it's good. I think I know exactly, I think I know where you're I'm going. I'm not very good that. at asking questions. I just throw stuff out there. You're awesome at asking questions. And and, and like I said, the, the honor of being listened to is just, you're amazing. Thank you. Um, the, the, um, Entrepreneurs that are building markets that have never existed don't know how to price. They don't know, they don't have a distribution center system. You know, you think about it, let's look at electricity, which is one I've told before, but um, in 2006, 1.5 billion people on the planet had no access to electricity. Uh, two young guys, Sam Goldman, Ned Tozen, come forth with a solar lamp uh, which makes sense to people like us. We've seen mm -hmm. solar before. What they didn't fully get was that their customers would make two, three dollars a day. They would exist in places that had very little infrastructure, no distribution channels. Low income people had no way to finance these solar lanterns. Um, and, and equally as, if not more importantly, they had very little trust of this newfangled technology that may or may not work. $30 was the first price point. And um, that's a lot of money for people who make two, $3 a day. Mm -hmm. And so um, 
our idea was we would take this philanthropy, we would invest. I thought eight years would be long. We're still in 14 years later. Um, and that we would accompany this, the company as well. By that, I mean, we would use our, our social capital, our, our networks, our access to corporations. We would help them raise grant money so that they could build marketing systems, so that they could experiment, so that they could fail. And, um, and any money that came back to Acumen would be reinvested in other innovations serving low-income people. Mm-hmm. That single company, D-Light, has now brought affordable light and electricity to over 100 million people. We then continued to learn with them and realized that we, were, we had to build a market. And so we then started investing in other companies like Delight, as well as financing companies and in um, mini grids and what was called nano grids, like just a few houses hooked together. Um, and, uh, and you asked, how did we know if we're making a difference? What, how, do you, how do you measure impact? Well, we knew we could tell you how many people were getting access to light. We didn't know if it was changing their lives. We knew how much carbon we were displacing because prior to the solar, they were using kerosene, kerosene, which is dirty and and dangerous um, and terrible for your health. Um, But we developed something called lean data, which is a way of texting five, 10,000 customers simultaneously, asking them a series of questions from which we could deduce how many more hours were you staying up at night? What do you do with that time? Do your children do better or worse at school? What do you like about this? Would you recommend it to your neighbors, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? So today we're the largest off-grid energy investor in the world. One third of people on the planet who have access to off-grid solar and light um, and electricity are customers of the companies in which we've invested. Um, We have a very good idea of which companies are most effective at reaching the poor people, at, the, at reaching low-income people? Which companies are um, have the, the 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 most effective light lumens, luminosity, mm-hmm. so that the bright light, which are best for displacing carbon? Um, which companies provide the greatest customer satisfaction? And so we can now make decisions for how we allocate our capital based not just on financial performance, but from all these other indicators. Right. Yeah, it's beautiful. I mean, those are things that are never gonna show up on a spreadsheet, like how many young people stayed up an extra hour to study and what is, how do you gauge the long-term impact of something like that purely because somebody has a light that they didn't have before. And Rich, you talk about dignity. If you wanna see dignity made manifest, go into someone's house who has forever, for every generation, just seen darkness descend at six o'clock if you live near the equator and watch them flick a switch and light up their home. We so take that for granted. We so don't think about what it would feel like in an isolated or very congested Mm -hmm. slum area. Um, The fear at night, the sound of the bugs of human beings, um, all that changes. And what shocked me when we first started to see these units being sold was that often the first light that the woman would, a place would actually go outside the door and be their security light. And so how do you measure that? Right. I feel safe. I mean, that would be something you probably wouldn't have thought of, right? Never thought of it. Yeah. Mm-mm. Yeah. I want to I want to better understand this idea. You said a minute ago we knew that if we wanted to address this problem of just electrifying homes and getting lights in them that we had to create a market, right? So the, tell me what that means. Like the way I think about that and tell me if this is wrong. Of course there's that adage like don't give a fish, you know, teach somebody how to fish. But this is like we're gonna create a whole fishing infrastructure. We're gonna make the poles and we're gonna, you know, dam the river and we're That's gonna exactly do, you know, what like, this you is have like. to like create all of these other things in order for that one thing that you're focused on to even take root and 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 function properly. Absolutely. And I I 
I don't think I understood at the beginning that we were helping to build a market. And obviously we were one player of many. But um, I used to say when people would say, oh, so what Acumen does is teach a man to fish. And I would say, with all respect, if we're working in a coastal community, they know how to fish. Right there, yeah. <laughs> they they tell you they, they tell you how fishing works, they right? Tell us yeah. how. They don't need us to teach them how to fish. They need a cold chain. They need to know that when they fish in climate crisis and it is so hot and they're bringing back their lower stocks of fish because our oceans have been depleted and they can't keep them cool, they're going to lose all their fish. And so unless we find them ways to get them a cold chain, it doesn't matter if they know how to fish. Mm -hmm. We need to find them people who will buy the fish at prices they can afford with some level of transparency. And I would just go off. So what I was essentially saying without understanding what I was saying, we got to build a market. That is what's needed. And 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 after 20 years of in investing patient capital and we've invested about 140 million in about 135 companies on the patient capital side. And then we have about 200 million that we manage in for-profit funds. Mm -hmm. But on the patient capital side, um, building new markets is one of the most important things that patient capital is used for because you're essentially um, going to places where functioning markets have never existed. People depended on kerosene. Kerosene is, a, or diesel in Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, Everyone knows how that market works and it's highly extortionary, um, very subsidized by government. You get votes if you get people kerosene. So now we're gonna create a new market that gives more ownership and power to individuals by disrupting the one that already existed. That is really hard to do. In the United States, you would get billions of dollars or millions at least from government. Look at Tesla. But when it comes to poor people, that money doesn't exist. And right. so patient capital is in a way a form of that early stage R&D, marketing, finding the entrepreneurs, supporting them to build different parts of what I would call the ecosystem so that you are enabling different companies then to service mm -hmm. a whole industry that had never existed. Mm -hmm. And then the piece that we don't talk enough about is that if you do that well and you solve a fundamental problem like the lack of electricity, so do you create jobs. And so we are, we may be the biggest investor, but there are many investors now in the off-grid solar industry. That industry has gotten 400 million people total um, access to electricity and created 400,000 really good jobs, like careers. Uh, and, and that's how we need to think as a world, um, including in the United States. If we solve our fundamental problems in ways that transcend left thinking, right thinking, it's the government, it's the private sector, but actually use the tools at our disposal, mm -hmm. we could build a better country, include people who've been for too long left out, get rid of some of the left-right conversation that only reinforces inaction, and most importantly, solve some of our biggest problems. Mm. Right, this idea of moral imagination. Moral imagination. Yeah. It requires you to step outside of that rubric altogether and just see all of this and appreciate it in a broader context. So to, yeah, talk a little bit more about like what that means. Yeah, and I would say even since I, I wrote um, Manifesto for Moral Revolution, my understanding has deepened because I think it also starts with seeing the moral force in other human beings and all other human beings. And um, it's this idea that um, we can solve our toughest problems. We start with a sense of empathy. I see, I, I see you first and foremost. Um, I, I understand that you have a problem, but, it's, but if you just stop at empathy, you've reinforced the status quo. Oh my goodness, I feel so sorry for you. This is a terrible situation, period. So what? The next piece is immersion. We talked about it with Sanergy, the uh, sanitation company. Get close to the problem, understand it. Understand it, not from your perspective, but from the, the person who is actually dealing with the problem. 
And the third is then to analyze it systemically. What are the forces that get in that person's way? And can you be honest about where that person mm -hmm. might get in her own way? And then finally, it goes to action. Um, for sh short term is willingness to see the world as it is. And that takes a lot of humility um, and truth yet always holding to the audacity of the world that you're building. Those D-Light guys, from the very beginning, they were in their 20s, were going to light the world. They mm -hmm. were going to eradicate kerosene. It was crazy, an impossible idea. And, um, and yet they had to deal with the junk around them of status quo, including the diesel mafias that didn't want them to succeed, the poor who didn't trust them, um, the lack of financing, um, inertia, complacency, bureaucracy. They had to fight all of that and not turn away from it with just silly idealism, not just buy the stuff and hand it out. We call it spray and pray. They had to build a system. They had to build a company. They had to build a market. And now- That's the hard work. Like making the light is the easy part, is the easiest part in the whole thing. Oh my you know, goodness. Right? <laughs> I and this remember. gets played out. I mean, right, you have a million examples of this in all of these companies that that you've worked with. I mean, the you know the intraocular lens company and the the mosquito nets and the coffee company, and like that's a whole fascinating thing about kind of uh, you know dealing with the commodities market and affordable housing, and you know it goes the list goes on and on and on. Yeah, so many engineers over the twenty years have come to us and said. Jacqueline, this is the best water technology um, that the world has ever seen. It will solve all the problems of poverty. And I'll say, well, go try it. And they'll say, no, no, I built the, the, the technology. You go build the market. It's like, uh, the technology is the easy part, my love. Mm. Have you spent time with people to actually understand how they make decisions, what they value, how much money they have? Are they willing to pay? Because I promise you this, you wanna get people water? You got to deal with the fact that many of them think water comes from God. God will decide whether they get sick or not. It doesn't matter if you think it's so clean. We had this company that did reverse osmosis. Um, no, they did um, desalination to get all the impurities out of the water. Um, they made the water too pure and people didn't like the taste. So you've got to have the it's moral all about magic taste. to care. Yeah. Is this something people will value? Can I get it to them in a way that they afford? They can afford. Because if I can't, you're gonna fail. Right. And that whole message is like a fly in the ointment of Sand Hill Road, right? Like, because it's all about the, the, the doodad. Like, if you just make the best doodad, we can change the world. And there is an arrogance built into that and, and a lack of appreciation and for Right, right, right. And what we're seeing in the world is move fast mm -hmm. and break things can sometimes really break a lot of things. And so when you're dealing with very vulnerable societies, communities that have seen cheats and charities come and go, they have good reason not to trust. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't move fast and break things. You have to make a commitment to show up and show up and show up um, and take the problems on with the people that you are there to serve. And that's what separates. Right. A, a bit, you talk about this in your book. It's, it's that persistence thing. You don't have to be the fastest, but you have to, what do you say? Slow, the prize goes to the person who slows down the least. You gotta just yeah. keep, keep the slog. Yeah, it's not very romantic. It's not very sexy. Cause that's the heavy lifting that you do behind the scenes when, when no one's looking. It's not very sexy. Yeah. But when you go into a village and everyone has light and electricity because of the companies that you have. Oh, it has have. to be unbelievable. It is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. I was sitting with a Rajasthani woman, um, a group of them, and we were talking about their, their D lights and, um, and I was complimenting them on the courage to, to move from kerosene to solar and asking them for the different reasons they did it. And I was hearing all the same reasons that people talk about. You know, it's, they could go to the bathroom at night and see snakes with their light and so security again, but the children studying, et cetera, et cetera. And then one woman said, I don't feel stressed anymore. And I said, 
what do you mean you don't feel stressed? And she said, well, when I had a kerosene lantern, I was always worried that it might fall over and hurt the children or even kill them. And I said, well, that's very interesting, ma'am, because the, one of the founders, Sam, uh, started this company because he was living in Benin, West Africa, and his neighbor's kerosene lantern fell over and burned down the house and nearly killed his eldest child. So he started delighting. And now I'm sitting across from you. And she looked at me and, and, a, and tears came down her um, face and she said, please, madam, would you thank that young man for me? And I thought, what is success? Mm. Making all this money yeah. or being Sam Goldman? Yeah. And having a woman on the other side of the world, illiterate, I don't know how she make my dollar, $2 a day. Thanking it's you pretty cool. for changing her life. Yeah, it's so cool. Um, what an amazing life you've lived. I mean, the, the legacy of that and the impact and hundreds of millions of people impacted by the work that you're doing and being kind of like, you know, an iconoclast in your earlier days and now sort of a mentor to so many young people and to kind of bring it back around to, to COP26. You know, my only um, takeaway from that is what I read in the press. So I don't, that's why I asked you like, what was it like being there and what did you take away from that? But my sense is that with our generation, there's a calcification around, you know, just we'll do just enough, you know, we'll do just enough. We'll say the right things. We'll make some slight adjustments, but there is a lack of appreciation for just how dire things are. And the radical shifts that need to be made in order to truly address this in a meaningful way. And then we have a whole younger generation of people coming up who are incredibly passionate about this, who mean business, who can look to you as this lighthouse who has, who has you know, guided their path in certain ways. And the level of enthusiasm like this, the things that you care about seem to be, the point I'm trying to get at inelegantly is that that your sensibility seems to be part and parcel, like built into the DNA of the generation that is coming up right now, which gives me hope. And so I suspect that you have quite a few opportunities where you're talking to young people, engaging their interest level and trying to guide them into, you know, the right pathways for them to express their talents in the most meaningful way. Um, well, thank you for saying that. I, I feel that I sometimes am clunkier than I would like. What I loved your podcast with Adam Grant, where you said that you are neither a politician nor a preacher, but lighthouse. Uh -huh. And when you said it, I was thinking, I think that's the category I would be in as well. Um, so I also just, it's interesting that you put it that way. Right, we, we, we're we creating our own ca category, Adam Grant. He's gonna have to write another book. He has to write another book. <laughs> he has to figure out a P. He forgot for about it. the lighthouse. He forgot the lighthouse. Adam, well, paging Adam Grant. The lighthouse Grant. though is sometimes complex with this next gen in that, um, because I agree with you, the next generation understands we need a new capitalism. And the next generation, it, well, what is the next generation is, is complex, right? I think right. that generations are almost new every five years. The, the, the youngest one that's coming up, I think really is focused on building. And building is less pure than the ones that just tell you everything that's wrong with the system. And I think there's an important differentiation there. Um, one young woman read my book, Manifesto for Moral Revolution, and said, I thought I was gonna read Angela Davis. And here's a woman mm. who's talking to me about markets, I hate it. And I was like, Good point there. Um, it's a it's a very bold title. I mean, if you're going to write a book and you're going to you're first of all the first word is manifesto. It's like how dare you? Oh, no, and no, then I know, I know. a moral no, 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 revolution. No, no, I, I could have I might have judged it yes, a little bit differently. Jacqueline being the arbiter of all things moral. Oh, oh, I just got I just got this great um, one of our our Dutch entrepreneurs. You can count on a Dutchman for just telling you like it is. He said, um, I didn't want to read it because I thought you were gonna do all this moralizing. Mm -hmm. And then I read it and all I saw was myself, um, that it's really all about all of your struggles. Um, and I so related to that part of it. But, um, but what we were talking about was really this next gen. And, um, 
and what they relate to is a world that is inclusive, that is just, that is sustainable, that we have to build a new set of tools. There's a big debate around, are you tweaking the edges by continuing to even use capitalism or the tools of capitalism, or should we destroy the whole thing? Mm -hmm. And It's back to the nuance thing and and the non-binary. And that's where I will, will always make that plea for nuance and try quickly to go to those examples where we have a radical generation of entrepreneurs that are are coming up. And what gives me energy rich is not my ideas, but really learning from their ideas. I, in some ways they are mentoring me and allowing me to be an iconoclast again, mm-hmm. which is so exciting. Yeah, Because I would say the last few years have been so hard, but now the paths are, revealing themselves again in really exciting ways. And so um, I'm seeing much more radical financial facilities being built um, with a clear headed rationale for what's needed. So um, an example in your your town, Los Angeles is every table, the restaurant. Right. So guy named Sam Polk, he's a Wall Streeter. getting burned out on Wall Street and and learns about this phenomenon of food deserts. You go into an urban center and same as I was talking about with water and the poor, food is exorbitantly expensive. You can't get nutritious food. Um, it's just a lot easier and faster for people actually to get fast food because nothing else exists. And so um, his first move is a classic first move. I'll start a nonprofit. And that nonprofit is very effective in helping people understand, but it doesn't solve the problem. So he ultimately decides to create a restaurant that is fast, nutritious, and affordable called Every Table. Um, And he starts in Compton. That restaurant is so appreciated by the local residents that um, he quickly scales to eight restaurants. We're early investors, so we're all happy. When the pandemic hits, and I saw this across our portfolio, how darkness can reveal the best of us, Mm -hmm. Sam decides, I'm not letting this slow me down. On day one of lockdown, he sends a tweet that says, "Um, if you need food, we'll deliver it to you. If you can't afford it, our mission is fast, affordable, nutritious food, we'll deliver it anyway. And if you're willing to pay it forward, here's a link. And within weeks, they were delivering tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of, of meals. Then government partnered with them so that they could reach homeless shelters and the people who had no access. Um, as of today, they've, they've delivered something on the order of 8 million meals. It's incredible. They've significantly grown their company. And along the way, Sam had always wanted to build franchises that were run by employees. And he started to learn that when you look at the McDonald's franchises and other franchises, the percentage of black and brown owned franchises is incredibly low. And so he again started to look at what are the constraints that keep people from being wealth owners, franchise owners, and can we spoke focus specifically on the systemic racial, racist constraints and so um, he built, well, his team built Every Table Academy, where they would allow high performing employees who wanted to run their own franchise to get trained. He understood they had no capital to put up front to build their franchise. So um, went out and is raising a $10 million loan facility where people will get a very, very low income I'm an interest rate over the next 10 years, but those that facility will then be on lent to the franchisee right. prospects. He will give them three years where they will be guaranteed $45,000 income so that they can still pay for their family to survive. And over the next seven to 10 years, when they pay off their loan to Every Table Academy, they will be full-fledged, mm. Franchise owners, right. employers, um, wealth holders. And he's on track, every table is on track um, 
to open 65 franchises by the end oh, of wow. 2022. So watch this space. Yeah, that's incredible. And they're moving incredible. to New York City, my city. Yeah, they gotta be in New York. I they mean, gotta be they in New York. They should be all over New York. I mean, New come York. on, they should be all over this country. That's an example, right? Is that, it's saying we can control the market. We don't have to be controlled by the markets. Economics is not physics. Economics is, is a social construct that we actually have a say in. And so, yes, use the tools of capitalism so that we can have this mm -hmm. generation and this ideation and this distribution and see where there have been long-term systemic injustices, injustices, fix them, give people a chance and watch the magic that happens. That's what so many of these companies are doing. That's beautiful. I mean, I know that the gravamen of your your focus is and has been in Africa, but this being in the United States and addressing, you know, this this is like a, a problem and an issue that comes up on the podcast all the time. The fact that we have these food deserts and the people who need access to healthy nutrition the most are deprived of it. And it's a very simple and elegant solution that leverages the best of capitalist market forces and creative kind of business planning to remove those barriers and allow these people to become stakeholders and invested in the success of the the affair, you know, each franchise of course, but the whole affair altogether. It's really powerful, like it's cool. It's so cool. And we've got 30 some odd companies across mm -hmm. the United States, many of which are um, bringing in ideas from the rest of the world and, and using them. A company called Isusu run by a Nigerian immigrant, um, Abi Wamimo and, and Samir Goel, his partner. And they, um, an Isusu is an African, they, we, in Kenya, we call it the merry-go-rounds. It's 10 women would get together. We'd each put a dollar in the pot at the end of the week. One of us would get the $10 and then the next week we would put our dollar in the pot and somebody else would get mm -hmm. it. And so depending on where you are in the cycle, you're a borrower or you're a, or you're a lender. Mm -hmm. And so Isusu is using that same idea, but to get help people build credit records, um, which are so hard to do in the United States by virtue of whether and how um, consistently they pay their rent mm -hmm. during the pandemic very similar and, and success breeds success. So they went out, um, Acumen helped them um, start a grant facility for rent relief to say, we are in this together. This is a pandemic. And if you can't pay your rent, let us know. We'll get you through it so that you can keep your credit record. And when you can pay us back, pay us back. Mm. And I'm seeing these models and frankly, these entrepreneurs becoming the kinds of role models that we need because they don't care about, again, the, the left-right politics. What they care about is solving problems in ways that put the poor and the right. earth at the center, not just profit. Right. And, 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 and that's the moral revolution, right? It is moving away from a frame that sees everything as the individual and everything as profit. And those who are successful are only those who are getting money, power, or fame to a world that insists on putting our shared humanity and the, and the sustainability of the earth at the center. How can you help impress upon people that interconnectedness? Like I feel like if, there's a, if there is a, you know, kind of virus that's infecting us as a culture outside of the, you know, the COVID virus, it's this idea of individualism and I'm here to get mine. And it's all about like me accumulating you know, irrespective of anyone else's concern. So disabusing people of, of that like manner of thinking and getting them into, um, you know, a, a broader, more compassionate, inclusive mindset of contributing rather than extracting. Cause fundamentally this is all about that. Like, it, and, and you say it outright in the book, it's like, can we live our lives where you know, when it's all said and done, we've we've contributed more than we've taken. taken, right? And if we could create like a capitalist metric around that and, you know, sort of judge people's success based upon how much you're contributing rather than how much you're extracting, we would all be in a better place. I think it's about a change in consciousness. 
I, one that's actually happening, and you see it in the in, in plant based worlds, that um, when you think about how we treat our animals is how we treat ourselves, how we treat our bodies is how we treat ourselves. Um, I think there is a growing consciousness, and and we've got to expand that in the stories that we tell, in the way that we model leadership. Um, I was just with the poet Marie Howe, um, who is the, was the poet laureate of New York. And she talks about, if only we could remember when we were ocean. Um, you know, we are all the earth. We're, we are, we're all made of stars. We are all part of each other. And in your life, and in my life, story after story is, is nothing but the interdependence. The story of getting the 45% of the African continent that doesn't have electricity, electricity, maybe used to be their problem. Now it's all of our problem because Africa as a continent is set to double in population over the next 25 to 30 years going from 1.2 to 2.4 billion. S suddenly, anybody who has a, ni a 19 or 20 year old knows what a kid is like. That's the median age on that continent. If we in Europe and the United States weren't worried about refugees and immigration, um, it's time now to see that correlation, that what happens there impacts us. There was a 15 year old at Cop Rich um, from India. And she said, I am an Indian girl. I'm a, I am a girl from India and I am a girl from earth. And I thought, God bless you. God bless your generation that it isn't binary. We can't just be nationalist or globalist. We have to be both. And and it's not just our connection and our connectedness to each other, it's to all living things. Teilhard de Chardin, who's a Jesuit philosopher who I, I love and read a lot of said, um, we are not human beings having a spiritual existence, experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And so I use the word moral almost as proxy for that transcendent, for that spiritual, for that belief that we are on this earth together for a very short moment. And I, um, I believe that we come in almost as circles and you and I are in a circle of a generation. It goes in a, in a, in a second. How do we use that time? How do we wanna be remembered by those future generations. I certainly don't want them to look back at us and think um, we didn't care, but that we tried. And it's only when we see that we are not just part of each other, we are each other, that I think we'll, we'll really solve these problems. That's so beautifully put. I have a million other things that I'd like to talk to you about, but I, I think you just stuck the landing and I don't even want to say anything else. You can still say. <laughs> but I do, I guess, uh, before we round this out, I do want to leave um, people with a few thoughts. You know, I think a lot, I think most people are struggling with trying to figure out how to build more purpose into their lives or find a way to be more fulfilled or, you know, how can I be more service oriented in the free time that I have? So how do you think about like helping to, you know, catalyze people on this journey of trying to, you know, figure that out for themselves and, and, and contribute along the way? Um, well, I have two answers uh, to that. And one, I hope doesn't sound self-promotional, but the um, the first answer is if a young person comes to me, it's really asking them, um, what do they love doing? What are they good at doing? What does the world need from them? Again, the Jesuits would say, go to where your deepest yearning meets the world great need. And too often we start with the I. Um, what's my purpose? What's my passion? Rather than if you see a problem, that interests you, go toward it. 
be curious about it. I have story after story of people who just start that way and end up making this their life's work. If you still have no clue as to what you do next, find a leader that you admire and get close to that person, learn from them. Um, you never know what direction that person will, will bring you. Um, but because so many people were coming to us and coming to me over the years, um, we started first a fellows program at Acumen where we brought people in for a year and would put them in our companies around the world. And then we started fellows programs within country after country. And now we have about a thousand fellows across the world who are doing just amazing things across race, class, ethnicity, um, religion. And, um, and then we thought we should start sharing this. And so we built Acumen Academy with, as the world's school for social change. So it's an online, this is the self-promotional part. Mm -hmm. It's an online platform where anyone anywhere can take a series of courses that start with, who am I? What, what can I build? Because this is a moment that needs all of us. It, it needs us to be conscious um, about how we spend our money, um, who do we give it to, what do we do? How do we spend our time? With whom do we walk? My grandmother always said, show me who you walk with and I'll show you who you are. And so um, the purpose-driven life isn't necessarily under this rubric of, you know, of uh, someone that's deserving of a medal or what have you. It's a life that's intentional. It's a life that's conscious of our action and our inaction. It's a life that's full of curiosity. It's a life that does a regular accounting of whether you're giving more than you're taking. And that asks regularly, not am I getting richer, thinner, more beautiful, but what am I doing to give other people a sense of self, a sense of their beauty, a sense of their possibility, a sense of their dignity. Um, I think that's what it's all about. Yeah. Thank you for that. I think that's the final word. You just want me to shut up. No, I don't. <laughs> We've been going for two hours. I could go for another two hours. I, I, I wanna leave people wanting more though. Um, what a beautiful soul you are. Thank you so much. I really appreciate you sharing today. And I just feel good in your presence. You know, you have a really great energy about you. And I have so much respect for the work that you do and, and uh, appreciate you sharing it today. Um, the book is Manifesto for a Moral Revolution. Have you read um, uh, the Book of Hope, the book that came out about Jean Goodall? I have it. I yeah. haven't read it yet. Oh, you Jane should read Goodall it. is right. who I want to be when I grow up. There's a lot of parallels between your book and that book in the sensibility, like this this sense, of, I, f I felt like a sensibility that you share with Jane and in, in this like audacity of hope, like, like throughout her life and all of the amazing things that she's done, like holding on to hope and having this optimistic, um, but fierce, you know, disposition and commitment to continuing to solve these big problems and this um, like reverence and excitement that she has about the younger generations and all of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of shared like thematic sensibility in your book with her book. Well, yeah. that is the biggest honor yeah, yeah. you could, pay me, I, 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 I've had the, the privilege of meeting her a few times and, and talk about being in someone's presence. Mm -hmm. She's extraordinary and, um, and she's a lighthouse. Yeah. Where I think you also um, share, this is a moment where so many people move from places of disrespect, from shaming and throwing aspersions, Jane focuses on the possible, on, on seeing goodness, on building from that goodness. And um, I've never heard her shame um, in ways that demean. Yeah, she never, elevates, right? Never. Ever, yeah. ever. 
And we need more of that. Yeah. And it can be complicated because sometimes it seems to a young, younger person or maybe just any people, sometimes it seems that, um, well, you're not, you're not truth telling. You're not really standing on what's right rather than, oh yes, you are. And you try to cross her, um, you won't get very far. Right. And I feel the same. But really understanding the psychology of change, right? Like you, shaming people isn't gonna move the needle. It might make you momentarily feel, you know, bigger than the other person, but that's a fleeting, <laughs> you know. I've never seen thing. it push people to act. No, of course not, right? So you have to consensus build, you have to work within systems and outside of systems. And we need all manner of revolutionaries. We need, we need the people on the, on the edges as well, holding everyone else accountable. Like all voices are, are needed. But I think, you know, you sit in this place where you have this facility for creating change, like taking the, like the, the mechanisms of, of banking and you know, all these things that most people don't understand at all and getting them to work in unison with a purpose and a goal that I think we can all get behind. Well, let's be really clear. I hire people who are a lot smarter than me. It's so like well, that's smart all too. Other pieces. Yeah. <laughs> huh. um, but yeah, I do think that that is what it's it's about. We've got the tools. Mm. We've got the skills. We certainly have the capital as a world. Mm. And that is where that piece of moral imagination that 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 consciousness that we are in this together and that we rise and we fall together is the piece that we've got to hold together. Whether we're the storytellers and the amplifiers or the builders, whether we're the entrepreneurs or the financiers, we're, we are, we're all needed. Um, Amen, sister. Amen. All right. Um, Manifesto for a moral, moral Revolution, pick it up wherever you buy books. And Jacqueline, you're easy to find on the internet. Where's the where's the place you want to direct people? To Acumen? Yeah, acumen.org yeah. on the cool. website. All right, and come back and talk to me again sometime. I would love Delightful. it. Delightful, I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Peace. Bye.